We are going to have Mark Pilgrim speak to us about cracking at scale. Welcome, Mark. Hello. So, uh, yeah, before we get to that, I want to start with a joke. Warm up the audience. It's not dirty. <laughs> Where does the cracker throw all his dirty bits when company comes over? <laughs> Under desync. <laughs> all right. Totally warmed up now. <laughs> totally warmed up. This is a tough crowd. All right. So let's talk about cracking Math Blaster. So if you want to crack Math Blaster, the first thing you're going to notice is that the bootloader is encrypted. And when I say encrypted, it's encrypted with a one byte key, okay? But it's still encrypted and it decrypts like into memory and not on disk. So you're going to have to uh, decrypt it and then capture the decrypted version. And when I say it's encrypted with a one byte key, every disk is different. Because of course it is. Once you decrypt the bootloader, then you're going to you're going to find the weak bits protection check nestled in in the uh, in between the regular disk reading code, which reads uh, track zero, sector zero, address epilogue twice and make sure that it's different every time. As John was mentioning this morning in the applesauce talk, this was a fun trick used by many different protection <laughs> schemes and protectors to ensure that the storage medium returned random data, which sounds insane, but it's copy protection. So you're going to want to disable that. It has rotating address prologues, different on every track. You're going to want to normalize that. It has a different nibble translation table than standard DOS, just slightly different. You're going to want to definitely notice and normalize that. As an RWTS swapper, because this is protected, but you might have like a data disk, you might have a save game disk, a character disk, di just side two. So you're definitely going to want to disable that, otherwise stuff's going to blow up later. The disk volume number on the disk is 000, which is literally impossible to create with standard tools. You are definitely not going to want to change that because it's checked at runtime repeatedly from inside a basic program that changes that changes its own environment and reruns itself, which reveals a new basic program, which changes its own environment again. It's changed as if you know it's changing the start address of app, the AppleSoft basic program in memory in zero page. But apparently that's a thing that you can do from inside an AppleSoft basic program because that's insane. But it's copy protection. So okay, so the second level um, changes its own environment again and then reruns itself again and the third level actually starts the game. The second level is where the copy protection check is and it checks for disk volume number zero, zero, zero. So you're definitely gonna wanna keep that. The embedded serial numbers, plural. Definitely want to go, going to want to erase those. And all the shifted DOS entry points because the entire disk operating system is compatible with DOS 3.3, but all the entry points are shifted to the left by two bytes, which gives you essentially thousands of possible memory locations that you could check later at runtime to make sure that you really booted from the original disk and that it has this wacky DOS where everything is off by two bytes. Turns out you can keep that, and you better, because it's checked, as long as you do all the other stuff first. So if you get through all of that, then what you get is Math Blaster. Yay! No, no clapping yet. But if you write a program to do all of that, and you find the DOS bootloader, but then you immediately find the encrypted RWTS. You extract the key, you decrypt it, you erase the serial numbers, you disable the RWTS swapper, you normalize the nibble table, uh, erase the other serial number, decrypt the RWTS, write it back, uh, and I don't even remember.
remember what the heck that last thing is. And um, then you get all these other programs that have exactly the same procedure. Overview of the Bible. I've heard it's a big seller. <laughs> Spell it, word attack, also by Davidson and Associates who wrote Math Blaster. The entire series of Bingo Buggleby presents, including outdoor safety, and um, all the way down here at 19, in 1990, 1990, Grasshopper Dissection, which is amazing. <laughs> that sounds like a metal band name. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I to judge? And Ultima Four. same protection. And now I have your attention. <laughs> Guess which one got cracked first? <laughs> it was not a good guess. Anyone have another guess? Yes, it was definitely Ultima 4 and all of these were rotting away on physical media until very recently. And we see this pattern over and over again. Once you start seeing it you see it everywhere. If you can crack Spanish Achievement 1, then you get Spanish Achievement 1. But if you write a program to crack Spanish Achievement 1, which is a little bit involved, <laughs> then you also get English Achievement 1, English Achievement 5, but not English Achievement 2 through 4 because they're different, because of course they are, because it's copy protection. Flash spell, helicopter, alphabetical order. Big sellers here. Sentence diagramming and Artie the Artvark. And Super Bunny and Argos and a bunch of other big, bigger names, at least, from Datamost and other companies that you might have actually heard of and that you might have actually played back in the day. But the guy who cracked Artie the Artvark back in the day, did not go back and crack Flash Spell Helicopter after he was done. Or she. And if you crack Ernie's quiz, hi Catherine. Catherine's not even here, oh my god, no. My first call out was a disaster. If you crack Ernie's quiz, then you get Ernie's quiz, but if you write a program to crack Ernie's quiz, the, then you get a whole bunch of very early educational software, productivity software. Apple themselves created this copy protection and licensed it to companies. They actually sought out budding stars. This, is a, this entire slide is like the, the before they were famous list. You have Instant Zoo, Mix and Match. These were you know Sesame Street from Children's Television Workshop. But then you also get magic spells from um, uh, the uh, uh, from Advanced Learning Technologies, uh, which quickly rebranded to the Learning Company, who made Rocky's Boots and Gertrude's Secrets, and all through the 80s and into the 90s. Um, the Speed Reader, which was the very first program by Jan Davidson, who founded later founded. Davidson and Associates, excuse me, Dr. Jan Davidson, but her doctorate was not in computer science. It was in um, American studies. She was a teacher. We'll get back to that. Crush, Crumble, and Chomp by a little company called Epix. Bumble Plot, Letterman, worst superhero ever. Shopping with the Yellow Pages, which is obsolete on so many levels. <laughs> And Elite, uh. the 1985 space arcade simulation strategy whatever game uh, with 3D wireframing and all sorts of fun stuff. Exact, exactly the same protection as Ernie's quiz. And it goes in the other way. It goes in the other direction too. Um, this is about Passport and Passport has improved since the last time I was here uh, when I introduced it last year. It now has a universal Activision patcher by, the, um, by Brian Troja, who is in the room. Thank you, Brian. And it turns out that if you analyze all of these 
big name Activision games, Hacker, Aliens, Hacker 2, Sh Shanghai, Alter Ego, Murder on the Mississippi, Rocky Horror Show, and you find the common protection check, protection code, then you can crack all of these games and you get How to Weigh an Elephant for free. <laughs> that was not an Activision title. It was by Litag. But that pro copy protection got productized. And that productized version was then offered to other companies. I believe through disk duplication houses, although if anyone has, was around back in the day and knows anything about the business of copy protection, not you, John, because you just write your own, but like anybody else, I really want to talk to you. But So these protections, even if they started in-house, they didn't stay in-house necessarily. Um, EA, Electronic Arts, famous for their uh, virtual machines in which they where they created their own virtual machine uh, their own interpretive language and then wrote the copy protection in that language because of course they did because that's insane and so if you write a universal ea patcher as cucumba did thank you cucumba where are you <laughs> that can crack sky fox and archon and archon 2 and arctic fox and movie maker and music construction set and pinball construction set and adventure construction set. We did a lot of constructing in the 80s. <laughs> and the bard's tale, then you also get financial cookbook, which as it turns out was also an EA title. No one has ever heard of it. It's so boring I don't even have a screenshot. <laughs> uh, it, was, <laughs> it was part of their very short-lived attempt in the mid-80s to move into home productivity software. They also did a word processor that no one ever uh, used called Cut and Paste, uh, which, and Financial Cookbook and Cut and Paste had exactly the same copy protection as The Bard's Tale, because they already had it. Guess which one got cracked first? Cucumba has also has been very busy. Also wrote um, a universal Sierra patcher which patches the self-decrypting nibble check while not tripping any of the myriad of anti-tamper checks that check that you have not modified the self-decrypting nibble check code or bypassed it because there are side effects. And that works and has been tested on Aquatron Marauder, Mr. Cool, which is a fun little Kubert clone that I just discovered in this process, Space Quest, Black Cauldron, Apple Cider, Spider, uh, BC's Quest for Tires, Sammy Lightfoot, which was one of my favorite games, and also Donald Duck's Playground, <laughs> which was not. <laughs> and so this is all now in Passport. And I, I, I was here, and if you don't know what Passport is, very briefly, it's an automated disk verification and copy program. I released it here a year ago, and I'm back a year later to tell you that it has been under active development for the last 371 days. And besides the Universal Activision Patcher by Brian, thank you, the Universal Electronic Arts, CR Online, and Optimum Resource Patchers. That's Sticky Bear and a whole lot of other fun stuff. Thank you, Cucumba. There's the Protected DOS Tracer and v d d Decryptor and Normalizer and all that, whatever all that stuff was. That's the Math Blaster that I showed you earlier. Uh, DOS 3.3, that's the Ernie's Quiz. Uh, a bunch of other stuff, BBF9, it was a, another desync, like the E7 desync that I gave a presentation on two years ago. Uh, a bunch of company-specific ones. Datasoft had an encrypted bootloader that was just insane. John Brooks, thank you, John, came last year and gave me his copy of, an original copy of Tomahawk, which he wrote, which means it is one of the few games in this collection that 
was um, where it was supplied by the original author. Although, oddly enough, not the only. But we'll get to that in a second, too. Datasoft, Gamco, they did a whole bunch of, you know, capitalization and commas and, you know, like, this was the market uh, for, uh, but they were copy protected because, of course, they were. Gamco was fun. They, they used Beagle Compiler and they poked a uh, bad block check into memory and then called it. But, of course, there's no basic source code because it was compiled with Beagle Compiler. So, uh, anyway, so it was fun. And by fun, I mean, you know, actual fun may vary. But, <laughs> And so that's all in Passport. That's all new protections since J July 12th, 2016. Uh, self oh, yeah, self-destructing self -destructing mech disks. Did you know one of the things that mech did, mech, you know, Oregon Trail and Word Munchers and, okay. The, one of the things that they would do sometimes is they would send you a master disk and then they would send you a limited boot backup. And you could only boot the limited boot backup 50 times, and it, there was a counter when, when it showed, and of course it would check if it was right protected and check that it actually decremented the counter and whatever, and just did, you know, the standard stuff that you would do if you were implementing a, a counter, and when the counter got down to zero, it would say, I'm sorry, you've booted this disk too many times, uh, and the purpose was, oh, and then it would trash the disk catalog, just in case you wanted to reset the counter later. Because, the, of course it did. But this was to... Uh, if your original disk, your master disk, got damaged, you were to send it back to them. And they would send you a replacement in the mail. Well, that takes time. We think about distribution, software distribution these days, which takes seconds or minutes or hours, and this took weeks. So you could use the program in your classroom or in your home or whatever, wherever you were, a limited number of times while you were waiting for your new original disk to get in the, anyway, so, but they were nasty, and I mean, other than being copy protected, they also had this extra thing, uh, and so Passport takes care of that, so that's fun. Um, uh, fixes, because, oh my god, there's so many edge cases, fixes to Scholastic, like Bank, Bank Street Writer 2, uh, Grolier, who is a big educational uh, software developer, Mac, uh, so many different Mac bootloaders, um, Passport will now tell you about uh, ProDOS RWTS variants, uh, which it didn't used to do, and so it surfaces the fact that that sort of hid the fact that the disk was protected um, because it would say that there weren't any patches, which is true, there weren't any patches, but is able to read it anyway because of the built-in RWTS supported exactly the protection that it had, but then it didn't tell you that it was protected, and so it looked the, the log that Passport produced was exactly the same as it would produce for an unprotected disk. So this sort of surfaced more information. And that's, you know, beyond the cracking, which is cool. Um, this Passport is fundamentally a verification program and an and information uh, mining, a data mining program. And the, the, the raw material, the ore that it's mining it, with its diamond pickaxe. Okay, it's possible I've been playing too much Minecraft. <laughs> I'm gonna back up. Um, Scratch that metaphor. Um, put that in the chest. Passport is surfacing information about these disks that may or may not be readily obvious. So things like third-party DOS, or uh, Dawson, which is the plural of DOS, uh, like Diversity DOS, Pronto DOS, David DOS, Quick DOS, these, these third-party um, DOS, because of course Apple DOS 3.3 was very slow reading files, and so there was this market that sprung up. Uh, you know, I had a copy of Diversity DOS growing up, and it, you know, you did the, like the master, you know, maker disk, and it, you boot it up, and it says pay it's shareware, pay thirty dollars, and you, you know, whatever. And I don't know a whole lot of people who did that. I did not do that. I'm sorry, but it turns out, and I can prove it with numbers, because I now have an, I've looked at enough disks and. By I, I mean Passport, has looked at enough disks that I can see that a lot of educational developers used a real file system. They just, you know, it wasn't like a custom loader and whatever. It was just, you know, it was DOS, except it was Diversity DOS. Or it was DOS, except it was Pronto DOS. And that's where 
those products made money, and they made a lot of money based on the number of titles that I've found that use Diversity DOS or Pronto DOS or David DOS even, which was a, a relatively obscure one. Anyway, so all of this, this information surfacing is, is new uh, in the last year. Um, other new things, uh, it now the, the upcoming release, there's a stable release that was released in May, uh, which you can download right now, I'm gonna give you the URL, but uh, the upcoming release uh, supports RAM disks, ProDOS RAM disks, both RAM Factor and uh, RAMWorks and RAMWorks clones, bless you, and uh, GS RAM disks, which means that it can read the entire floppy in one go and write it to the RAM disk as it's going and then write it all out in one pass. A bit faster, way cooler, and I finally get to use my 8 meg RAMWorks clone. It's very exciting. Use, so, compatible with every RAM disk. I had nothing to do with it except I tested a bunch. It was all Cucumba. Thank you, Cucumba. Yay. <laughs> Speaking of Cucumba, I'm not sure actually how much work I've done on Passport. No, I'm kidding. I did a lot of work. But uh, speaking of Cucumba, the original version of Passport that I released a year ago at KFest was written in Merlin, which was a fine choice, and released on a disk image with all the Merlin source code because, uh, because then it was edited in Merlin and it was assembled in Merlin because that's how Merlin works. And now, thanks to Cucumba, we have migrated to modern text files that sit on modern laptops and are cross-assembled with modern open source tools. Uh, the, the particular assembler we use is called Acme. Uh, is open source, is on SourceForge. Uh, so you might want to download it quickly in, in case SourceForge disappears. Um, it has a real make file uh, and the entire re repository is up on GitHub and there's the URL. And there you can go download all the source code. It's just separate text files and you can down, and it has the maker uh, the make the make file and it has the readme and you can go build the latest version yourself uh, with if you have acme and uh, you can help us test maybe if you like or or just you know run it on your own disks or you know, whatever you like open source uh, still um, well it was open source before but it's still open source and it still runs uh, on an apple 2 plus with 64k um, but again, with the RAM disk, if it happens to find a RAM disk, there's no configuration, it automatically looks for a RAM disk. If it happens to find a RAM disk that's big enough to hold a whole floppy disk image, then it will use it, and otherwise it just won't bother you, because that's how software is supposed to work. So last year I announced in, uh, uh, simultaneously with the release of Passport, the tool, that uh, I was also releasing 42 previously unpreserved uh, educational disks that had been cracked by Passport. That number has grown a little bit in the last 365 days. Oh. <laughs> Some of those were cracked back in the day because the Activision and the EA and the Sierra, you know, the, and whatever. So some of those, but of those 542, Many of them are preserved for the first time. Four hundred and twenty-five. Um, at its heart, as I said, Passport is a verification tool. The reason I wrote it initially was not even to crack stuff, but to verify that the .edd images, which you've heard other people talk about, I won't go into that, but the copy protected disk images without anything stripped out, the EDD images that I was making from my floppy collection, that they were any good. I didn't know, there, were, there was no way to test it. I mean, I could, I, I could boot it in an, in, in an open emulator, but what if that doesn't, like what if there's a sector that is only hit on level seven, you know, what, like I couldn't, I couldn't play test the whole thing and guarantee, anyway, so I just wrote this verification program and then uh, it just takes a whole directory of .edd files and it uh, mounts them up in Open Emulator with a little bit of uh, massaging and it runs Passport inside of Open Emulator 
and it takes the, a, uh, the text screen and saves that off to a log file, and we have 4,065 verified EDD images, about two-thirds of which are copy protected, as far as I can tell. Uh, and they are all available on archive.org. I don't remember what the URL means. Don't ask. It's from a Douglas Adams book. I don't even remember which one. I'm sure someone knows. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, first one. Excellent. Thank you. That does sound like me. Okay. That was actually a coincidence. Okay, so what can you do with 4,065 verified EDD disk images and the resulting .dsk image with all of the protection, if there is, stripped off, and the .text file that is the passport log, or at least the last screenful of the passport log, as you saw, some of the passport logs are getting a little long. Um, but what can you do with this data set? And you can do a lot of technical anthropology, and I did a little bit of this last year, so I just wanted to revisit. But I can prove that 202 of those 4,000-ish disks um, had identical copy protection. They all used the E7 bitstream. Back in the day, it was called generic bit slip. It was called Prolock, uh, I believe, was the marketing um, name. I did a whole presentation on it two years ago. You can go find that on archive.org. Uh, you know, 163 others had this uh, structural uh, thing where, like, every odd track used D4 A96 and every even track used D5 A96, or maybe it was vice versa. And 138 had the very difficult to copy uh, until, you know, there was a special case for it. But, like, every single ep epilogue um, had a, the regular DE and then a timing bit. Like, the protection was literally built in to every single sector on the disk. And 123 had uh, this, had essentially identical code, although there were some options and variations apparently that you could select in the maker program that, um, but it was, uh, it, you, it was identifiable because uh, the early boot jumped to, did an indirect jump uh, to BBFE, which pointed to BB00, which was a page that is later overwritten but is unused at boot, so it was a good place to put code. Anyway, so all of these, uh, you know, this the, the one that destroys originals, that was the, the mech, uh, but like all of these were from different companies. Like those, it's not 202 disks from the same company that you are using the E7 bitstream. It's from dozens of companies. Um, all the different Eduware manufacturers, um, Grolier, Focus Media, Developmental Learning Tools, The Learning Company, Davidson and Associates, Sunburst, Troll Associates, I'm missing so many, Hartley Courseware, they all used and reused protection. And that's, that's what Passport targets. That's why it's so successful is because, yes, there's going to be like that chess program that J Jason was talking about that Cucumber was spending hours, literally, I watched him, it was hours, he was still not done. This is a grandmaster cracker, okay? The, the, the chess program beat the grandmaster cracker. By the time I left, which was about 1 a.m., um, not the other time that you're thinking, but like he hadn't defeated it yet. Okay, so yeah, there's going to be that thing, and I, we've never seen it anywhere else. We've never seen it since, before or since. That, yet, yeah, there are a lot of one-offs, and they're fascinating, and they're deep dives. And there's also hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, in many cases, completely unpreserved disks that are gorgeous, that are fun, that are interesting, that they bought instead of built the protection. It was an add-on. It was a value add. As I said, I believe it was through the disk duplication houses. Uh, but it was, you know, it wasn't integrated into into anything. It was just, uh, oh yeah, give us the latest thing. Oh, we reissued the, the disk. Oh yeah, give us the latest thing again. So I have two copies of, you know, Troll's Tale, uh, which have different copy protections. I have, you know, different uh, uh, versions. Of course, the disk labels look identical because, you know, 
of course. Uh, but there, it turns out they're different versions because they fixed a bug, you know, and they re-released it, and you know, or they ran out of the first one and they re-released it. <coughs> Completely different copy protection because time had passed and six months had gone by and a new version of Copy2 Plus had come out and there was a, there was a, now a, there was just a menu item, there was a PARM entry, right? A parameter file that said, oh, I want to copy this kind of disk, boom. And they're like, okay, we got to change the protection then. But they didn't go build another one from scratch. They just bought it. Yes, question. Do you have any uh, knowledge or theories at this point as to what made, uh, went into the technical and or business decision by the software companies to outsource the copy protection versus make the investment to build it themselves? The question is uh, the thinking behind buy versus build yes. of copy protection. I, I don't know. I, I wasn't around. I was 11 in, in you know, in 1980. Three, um, I I just I, I don't know. I don't know a lot about the business side. I know a lot about the bits, and I, I'm sort of reverse engineering this entire industry from the bits up, which is interesting. But it might be easier to just talk to somebody <laughs> at some point. Um, but I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> this is still this is. <laughs> All this work is still better than talking to somebody, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. But it, seriously, if you know anything about, you know, like if you were at one of those companies that outsourced copy protection, yeah, yeah, you got something on that? Like you want to share or you want to tell me later? Well, 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 just real quick. Uh, so at Datasoft, there were three separate companies. One was uh, the software development group. Uh, another one was a uh, copying service who would get So uh, yeah, they, it's yeah. It's kind of like yeah. Paper. I, I viewed it as kind of as a classic baggie era evolved into the protection, duplication, and shipping kind of era yeah. of, of computer software, of computer development okay. before it went into the, the big retail distribution. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so basically, you know, it's, it's, it's a trade off. Copy protection is hard, it's a different kind of hard than education programming, you know, edu educational content, different kind of programming than uh, games. You know, it's, it's just different. Like, you need a guy, and, you know, Broderbund, they had a guy, they had Roland Gustafson, right? And he did all the copy protection for years, and they were all slightly different, and he just put his heart into it, you know. And Sirius uh, had a guy who did not actually work, he was a contractor, but, like, you know, they got... Epic, and then they got Beer Run, and they got Outpost, and they got Wavy Navy, and they got Flip Out, and they just like, here, here's a disc. And he's like, all right, I'm going to do my thing. And then, he, you know, they get back a maker program and, uh, and that can, like, write it onto a disc and be uncopyable. And they just like that it was just, it was outsourced to one guy. And then later, you know, it became a ca this cat and mouse thing. You got to remember, like, this is all static looking back on it. But this was very dynamic in the 80s. This was a whole cat and mouse, and you know, you could have a protection that lasted for you know a matter of months before it was broken, and then uh, like broken in the sense that you could get the new version of Copy2 Plus and look through their Parm entry list and search for your actual product name and just press a button and get a protected backup. On and then they're like, well, that's it. That's just that's the shelf life of a protection. Then and so now we need to start over. Well, that's really expensive. If you just you know, and so a lot of companies didn't want to do that. Yes. Were some copy protections not as well as others, and wound up damaging the program. Um, was that ever a problem? Was it not a problem? I don't know. I, I assume that that was. Um, 
taken care of internally um, in the sense that, you know, that was part of uh, QA testing and so on. Um, right, right, yeah, no, I, but, but you're right, you know, with the add-on nature of it uh, and the sort of the, 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 the discontinuity between the development and the actual final product, I don't know. I don't know of any major incidents like that. Unpredictable situations where things combined in a way that wasn't predictable. Right, right, yeah, no, I, I don't know of any major fa well, protection was, failures like that. Maybe, but it was expensive to make a good one, and making a good one was a was sort of an art form, and it was an ongoing art form because people kept breaking it. And anyway, so what else can we glean from four thousand automatically verified, automatically cracked images? Well, we can look at the bootloader, and Passport actually prints this information out into the log, and then we can collate that and you know do a what is this called a pivot table and we can see that you know st standard dos 3.3 was very popular because it was free and it was you know okay and pro dos uh after a certain point became popular but also we see things like diversity dos um and pronto dos and david dos down there uh with just a couple um and these are protected images so not only was the protection specific to you know DOS 3.3 instead of ProDOS, but it was actually built on top of Diversity DOS in particular, and that and like, or Pronto DOS in particular. Uh, there's one that uh, calls you know that, that puts um, uh, code <laughs> on uh, uh, an unused part of Pronto DOS, which is used in other uh, uh, third-party DOS. So like it, this was a specific combination that was then productized and sold as a, as a complete set. Um, and Diversity DOS was very popular. And these, you know, these are com companies like Hartley, uh, companies like um, Focus Media, Development of Learning Materials, uh, even MEC, uh, some, I uh, found some Diversity DOS. A anyway, and then also, you know, the, uh, the other um, bootloaders, uh, Electronic Arts and DOS 3.3P, that was the Ernie's Quiz. Uh, the JSR 08B3, which was the uh, Art of the Aardvark, um, Quick DOS, which was used on just a couple of uh, um, 64K required uh, games in the late 80s from Data East, Commando, and Platoon, and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, so we can, we can start seeing, instead of just looking at one disk, we can start seeing patterns and trends and statistics and relative popularity and all of these things. The last thing that this has shown me is what I call a tale of two trolls because I have two identical copies of Troll's Tale, which is a kid's adventure game from Sierra online. Uh, literally, the di I have two discs. I put them next to each other. You cannot tell anything. The, the, disc, uh, the disc labels are identical. The copy... Um, copyright statement is identical, you boot it, the, co the, the title screen is identical, the protections were completely different. So somebody revved something and, and there, are, there are other subtle changes, like somebody revved Troll's Tail and they put on a new protection and fixed all the bugs and sent it out again. And stuff like that, like one of those was never, never preserved until recently, and the other one was. Because nobody wants another copy, like nobody's going to go out of their way to put their name on, well, no, but this, 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 okay, it's Trolls Tale, and I know Mr. Crackman did the thing, but, but, but this is slightly different. No, like nobody did that in the 80s. But we can, we can go back and, and not spend a lot of time on them individually. I mean, I, had, I, had ED, I, I discovered this because I ran Passport on 4,000 disk images, and two of them were... Troll's Tale, one from this disc and one from that disc, and the logs, which I expected to be the same, were completely different. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? And I went back and looked at the original, and lo and behold, two different copy protections. And oh my god, so many sticky bears. Optimum Resource was terrible about, uh, what do you call it, silent versioning. Silent versioning. There are so many versions of sticky bear. 
Sticky Bear typing has like two different versions and Sticky Bear math has like four different versions that I've found so far. And all the disks look identical and all the title screens look identical and you just don't know until you look at everything from above. So what is, like, what can other people do? Well, I, you know, I, I want to talk about extraction, derivation, aggregation, and investigation. So uh, in the extraction category, um, these .dsk files uh, are, you know, disk images. Many of them, as you saw, use DOS 3.3. They use a standard file disk catalog. You can, therefore, uh, the deep protection process has opened that up to third-party tools like CiderPress, Apple Commander, a few others that can, you know, catalog a disk, that can extract um, text files from a disk. No offense, Jason. And uh, can, for instance, go, uh, somebody could build a tool like before dinner time. What is it? It's 312. Before dinner time today to extract all the AppleSoft basic source code across 4,000 disks. Um, and like print it out and, and output it to text file, to, to individual text files, and then make it searchable. I want to search all the basic source code ever written. Do it! Derivation, um, of course, Peter talked about this, uh, porting games to ProDOS. Um, you know, the, the, the cracking makes that possible, and also aggregation, uh, Marco Verpelli uh, did something similar with uh, mech disks using mech's own copy utility, well, a slightly hacked version, um, uh, so that it would, ignore, it would ignore, you know, the things we wanted to ignore. Uh, but then he made a, a 32 meg disk image with like 30 or 40 different mech programs on it. And you can boot from a hard drive and just select your thing. And this was a thing that you could do if you actually had, but nobody actually had 40 or 50 MEC programs except a couple of schools. And now anybody can do that. And anybody can make a collection. I've seen uh, on Facebook and CSA2, um, I've seen people making uh, collections of, you know, games, file-based file games, uh, all, you know, on one, on one hard drive. And investigation, and not just like, um, not just the technical Archaeology, although that's interesting. I mean, that's interesting to me. But also cultural anthropology. Um, the, you know, go go take a one company and watch watch them progress because we now have a very easy access to essentially the entire catalog of the learning company, the entire catalog of Davidson and Associates. The learning company was founded by. Dr. Leslie Grimm, again, not a doctorate in computer science, or a PhD in computer science. Uh, it was in uh, biology, I believe. And, uh, and her daughter, uh, uh, Corinne Grimm, age 11, this was from Bumble Plot. I also have uh, one that said age 10, uh, and, and I can narrow down when she, uh, like when in the year her uh, birthday is by looking at release dates and then how old it says she is. Anyway, so like investigate, you know, d deeply like one one company or or look at uh, all the disk catalogs and find like a, a font or character generation program. You know, the 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 high res character generator and and find all the copies of it and see who is using it and then see if there are any different versions and, and what they were, see if it added features over time. Go look into this stuff. And the last thing that I want to say is that I don't, I don't wonder anymore whether this is worth doing. And I don't argue with people who think that everything that's been preserved, that's worth preserving has been preserved because I've seen what's out there and what was rotting away on physical media and this data quest which is a, some sort of database you know whatever fact uh, you can cross section and whatever anyway it's called Europe and the Soviet Union it was copyright 1990 guess when the Soviet Union fell 91 just missed it <laughs> and squeegee the bookworm 
Squeegee learns about drugs. You know what Squeegee learns about drugs? That some drugs are bad and make you sick, like tobacco and alcohol. And some drugs are good and make you well, like vaccines. And now I don't wonder whether this is worth doing, because I know the answer. Because this, these aren't just bits, and they're not just disks, and they're not just artifacts. They are curriculum that we used to teach an entire generation of kids in the 80s, especially in the United States, where Apple II was popular, especially companies like Mech that were single platform. Um, last but not least, two things. One, probably shouldn't have done it that hard. This is about 600 mech disks. And I can guarantee that all of them have been imaged and preserved properly because I have booted every single one of them and checked the version number and checked the program and checked the information in, you know, in, in game. And I have made EDD images of them and versioned them and archived them and then verified all of those EDD images with Passport, uploaded the ones that were missing, so on, uploaded all the logs to Vogon Laundromat, and they are now yours. You may clap. I will put them on the pool table upstairs. It would be great if somebody could help me carry them up. I almost hurt my back carrying them down. But if <laughs> you're volunteering, okay, thank you. Great, great. Um, if there are any left by Sunday, I will ship them off to the Internet Archive. Uh, did you hear that, honey? They're not coming home. <laughs> my wife is going to watch this later. I love you, honey. I'm doing everything I can to get rid of them. And last but not least, I'm going to press C. Ooh, writing to RAM disk. I like that part. It found the encrypted RWTS. It extracted the encryption key. It is now using the disk's own really crazy RWTS to read the rest of the disk and write it to a RAM disk. And pretty soon, it's going to start making a couple of little patches, like the serial number, and the RWTS swapper, and uh, some other stuff that I forget. And it is actually writing it to slot 5, drive 1, which is on this USB stick for a CFFA 3000. <laughs> Are there any questions? Martin. Who is 4 a.m.? I don't know. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Ryan. Um, not so much a question, but more of a... a Are there any real problem? questions? A no, I'm kidding. A little bit of a history. Um, back in the day, and speaking about version of uh, GBA 101 Basketball from Activision, and I got it home and immediately was going to preserve it, and <coughs> I uh, right protected the disc, made a copy, I removed the protection, it was a nibble check on tracks um, 32 and 33 and, and decimal, and then I tried it, and it worked, and it was great, so I wanted to make sure it was properly preserved, so I put in the original, and I started it up, and it failed. So I immediately destroyed my preserved backup. I took it back to the seller, and he had told me that batches of them were coming back. Really? So at least one run of that game, and that's the only uh, uh, production run that I've ever known where the production of the copy protection failed. Wow. 
All right. Okay. That was a good anecdote. I'm glad I allowed that. Yes, Brian in the front. So uh, when applesauce uh, is available soon and we're producing flexes or DSKs from that, could we now or in the future point passport at a flex image or at a DSK that gets output and do its thing? Yes. The question is about applesauce, uh, which John Morris was talking about this mor in this morning session. Um, it does not currently, does it currently um, output FDIs or EDDs? It does. Okay, I, I haven't seen it in person, so I, uh, uh, which we need to fix uh, this evening. But uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so it can it, along with the flux capacitor yeah. image whatever thing that it does, it can also generate uh, you know sort of downsample that uh, to existing tools. But yes, uh, ideally you know we would have emulator support, uh, wide emulator support for EDD. As it turns out, there's one that does it properly, and Mame is still thinking about it, and. Um, Ideally, there would be emulator, direct emulator support for the new Flux images as well, but there isn't. Right. Um, but, you know, Passport runs on an Apple II if, or something that emulates an Apple II and emulates the disk drive well enough to read a protected original. Give me that environment and Passport will do the rest. So if we got a DSK or a NIB or EDD or whatever out of the Flux onto an Apple II disk, yes. maybe Passport could be pointed at that file and then yes. do its thing? Yes. Okay. Although, since Passport uses the disk's own code as a weapon against itself, eh, yeah, right. if that .nib file doesn't boot in an emulator because it doesn't have enough information, then, then the disk is going to fail to boot then Passport is going to fail to read it because Passport is, you know, okay. trying to use sure. that same code. Just build in native support for Flux. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? <laughs> yes, Dave Rose. And then Vincent. It's not so much a question as I was going to oh, dear Lord. something for Brian. I mean, yes, if, go on. If you, took, if you took one of those, like, FDI files and used Open Emulator and opened the file within that and ran Passport within that emulator, you could get an unprotected DSK file out of that. Well, yes, right and that, that is what uh, is on Vogon Laundromat, uh, is the EDD files and then the DSKs that, and the .text files that are the result of doing exactly that 4,065 times. Yes, Quinn. Oh, and then Vincent. Uh, excited to hear that uh, you're on cross-development now with it. Um, curious about the Uh, Cucumber chose it. Okay. He's used it on other projects, and he's most familiar with it. Uh, we're not doing anything terribly difficult. I mean, I was using Merlin before that, but even like we weren't using like anything terribly difficult in Merlin, it was just because I didn't know how to use it. Um, so it, it could probably be ported to other modern emulators, um, CC65 or you know whatever if you want to use it in Xcode and so on. But you could probably set it up in Xcode and then launch Acme under the covers. But I don't know that anyone does that because neither Cucumber or I use Xcode. Yes, Vincent. Uh, do they, have you preserved any of the um, actual like, maker software you described? That, like, have you come across any of that? Or? The question is about the maker programs themselves yeah. that create protected images. You should have been here last year when Martin gave a fascinating talk called Getting Back to 3.59 AM, uh, where he created a maker program that took a cracked version that had this productized E7 bit stream and the, and the code uh, integrated uh, and reintroduced the E7 bit stream in the place on the disk where it was looking for that and then uh, put the code back to the original so that it actually checked for the bit stream and it worked. He did a live demo and it, and it booted and it was amazing. Uh, you should talk to him about releasing that source perhaps. Hmm. Any other questions? No, there's been no, uh, nothing else, really. I mean, there's, there's all these different protections, and some are like, take up a whole track, and some of them take like just a couple of bits, and basically we have nothing. We have no uh, information about who made them. We have no source code. We have no binaries of them, nothing. We have nothing. It's a big black hole. Yes, I James. Have one shed some light on so that one point, you were saying that uh, the passport ran on a Apple II disk, but that might have been 
Apple it runs on any Apple II uh, with a six, uh, with 64K, which means Apple II Plus or later. Um, um, and it runs under ProDOS. Um, the, it comes with ProDOS 241. Thank you, John. And uh, but you know you could I I just ran it off my hard drive on on in the live demo there. It's just a single file. You can just copy it whatever to a, a ProDOS. Whatever, but yes, uh, it, it runs on a very wide variety of, um, and, and then quits to Prodos when it's done, you know, as you saw. Yes, uh, one more question. I wanted to say something about the preservation of Coffee Maker. Oh, yes, uh, Maker Programs. Yes. In France, we have the uh, Maker on the Virtual Stuff software. Excellent. So, okay, so we have just a scattering of maker programs. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, one more question. Stay with us. I point out that Antoine also made the maker program for DOS 2.3p available online as well. On Asimov, yes, that's true. Yes, uh, that, that came uh, just in the last year, I believe, uh, the, the, the source code. that th This is the disk that was given to, you know, the learning company and, and whatever uh, to create you know, a, a DOS 3.3, a protected version. Th this was the disk, and then they had to like sign a non-disclosure agreement not to distribute it. It was not protected. The, the maker, that maker program was not protected. No, was it? Wait, was it? No, it was not, but it was sold. It was? Sold. Ah, okay. It was not given, it was sold by Apple to the publisher. Oh, sold, okay, okay. See, I don't know anything about the business end. That's fascinating. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, we're almost out of time. Last comments. Take my discs. At least take them upstairs. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.